Welcome to this uh, webinar uh, organized by the Tchaikovsky Institute for Archaeology in the Ancient World uh, at Brown University uh, for what is a discussion of uh, our graduate program in archaeology here uh, at the Tchaikovsky Institute at Brown uh, University. We'll be talking specifically about the uh, admission process and everything that's sort of involved uh, with that. My name is uh, Peter van Nolen and I'm the uh, director of the Tchaikovsky Institute. And uh, we will uh, begin uh, this webinar, um, obviously, by introducing ourselves. As you can see, we're five panelists here. Uh, and I'll uh, start. As I said, my name's uh, Peter van Dommelen, and uh, I'm an archaeologist, obviously, uh, working in the Western uh, Mediterranean, uh, doing a lot of field work on the island of Sardinia, but also uh, wider throughout the West Mediterranean. My interests are in colonial and rural uh, matters um, in roughly the time between late prehistory and the Roman period. Um, I attended uh, grad school, although it wasn't quite named like that, uh, but I did my PhD uh, in the Netherlands uh, at the University of Leiden several decades ago. Uh, things have changed uh, and I've moved to continent. Um, and I've been 10 years here at Brown and involved in admissions uh, as long as I've been here. So. Um, with that, uh, I'll ask uh, Laurel Bester to for the, uh, invite Laurel for the next introduction of herself. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm Laurel Bestock. I'm an associate professor of Egyptology and archaeology at Brown. Uh, my, my research interests really are the material culture of the Nile Valley. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in kingship and violence, um, and I'm currently actually excavating a fortress in northern Sudan that was built during a period of colonial expansion by, by the Egyptian government in the early second millennium BC. I'm also very interested in archaeological methodology and have been working to develop tablet-based recording systems for archaeology uh, that work in places that don't have the internet, which is, is the case for my, my own site. Um, I've been at Brown since 2008 as a professor, but I was actually a Brown undergrad many more years ago than that, and I did my own doctoral work at New York University at the Institute of Fine Arts. Um, and I currently serve as the Director of Graduate Studies at, at Brown um, for archaeology. So you'll hear more about that in just a second. Uh, but right now, I will kick it to my colleague, Felipe Rojas. Hi, thanks, Laura. Um, I'm Felipe Rojas. I, uh, I'm an archaeologist as well, and I work primarily in Western Turkey and in uh, Southern Georgia. I'm interested in archaeology of memory and in the history of antiquarianism and archaeology. Um, work on reuse and spoliation. And in the past few years, I've been very interested in uh, engagement with Iron Age culture in Eastern Anatolia. Uh, I did my uh, doctoral work at Berkeley in the classics department at Berkeley. Uh, archaeology at Berkeley was in classics. So. That's where I did my, my degree. And uh, I'll hand it over to Dan Plekov. Hi, everyone. So my name is Dan Plekov. Um, I'm a graduate student in the Joukowsky. And uh, I'm actually a sixth year, so I'm in the process now of finishing my dissertation and on my way out. Um, and my work focuses on rural landscapes, um, long-term histories of agricultural development and infrastructure. Um, and so I did my undergraduate at Dickinson College um, in archaeology and classical studies, and then I did my master's in archaeology at Boston University before applying to the Joukowsky in 2016. Um, so yeah, and I'll pass it on to Leah. Hi, um, I'm Leah. I'm a second year in the PhD program, so much closer to the application process than the finishing line. Um, I'm interested uh, primarily in Egyptian archaeology and questions of health and the body, um, as well as archaeological pedagogy and public engagement. Oh, right. I did my undergrad at Sorry, did my undergrad at Emory in archaeology, uh, ancient Mediterranean studies, my uh, master's at St. Andrews in museum studies, and now I'm here. Thank you. That's a really relevant uh, uh, detail there. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, with this, we're uh, ready to start. So we've got one hour, uh, or a little bit less by now. Uh, the way we've uh, set this up, we want to how we want to run this is that we uh, well, first of all, we have already uh, received a series of questions from uh, quite a number of you. And we've broadly sort of divided this up uh, uh, in three 
broad topics. One about sort of thinking about grad school, where to apply, uh, how to prepare um, for uh, for grad school in general, and how to actually do that application. Uh, these are sort of just the broad headings to you know to at least to keep some uh, structure and system uh, to this discussion here. Um, Leah and Dan, uh, our two grad students, as you just heard, uh, they will sort of lead the, the webinar by uh, asking questions and giving answers themselves, giving their own background, and uh, we will um, give more background on it. All of you are able to ask uh, us other further questions uh, as well through the Q&A. Uh, type in your questions, uh, and once uh, questions there are being uh, listed, you can also uh, vote them um, and sort of uh, propel them to the top of the list, uh, as it were. Um, and with this, I hand over to uh, Laurel Bestock, our DGS, as you heard, who will begin with a very short uh, statement uh, explanation of our graduate program in archaeology. Laurel. Thanks, Peter. And you've just heard the acronym DGS. We use this all the time. We use acronyms in general all the time, um, but DGS is one that becomes a word in and of itself. And that's that stands for Director of Graduate Studies. And in this role, I serve as one of the primary advisors for all of our PhD students. And I'm really the one who is in charge of making sure that people understand program requirements and move through the program. Every student meets with me uh, every semester and, and certainly before dissertating, students meet with me quite often. Um, so I just wanted to take a couple of minutes because it's general to everything we'll talk about today to talk about the structure of the program itself once you get here. After that, we'll move more to application, but you need to know what you're applying for, basically. So the PhD program in archaeology at Brown is a six-year program. We only accept students to whom we give full funding guaranteed for six years. So if you're in the program at all, you are given a living wage and health insurance and, and, and tuition, et cetera. Uh, the first three years of our program are courses. So students take classes. The classes are predominantly seminars in archaeology, but it's a very interdisciplinary program. And our students really craft the coursework that they want to take based on their own interests. Uh, at the same time that, that students are taking courses, they're also learning languages and satisfying program requirements, such as, as exams. But it's really only after those three years of coursework that students begin to develop their dissertation project or to work on their dissertation. Their, the ideas for the dissertation are being generated already in those three years. But structurally, it's the last three years of the program that become the dissertation. Um, so I just wanted to, to sort of lay that out there. The dissertation, of course, is the, what you are awarded the degree for, um, but it is a whole combined program, which includes coursework and dissertating. And one last thing to mention is that the condition of funding for, for receiving your stipend is that in the middle years of the program, you also, students are appointed as either teaching assistants or proctors every semester. Um, teaching assistants are co-instructors or they're sort of junior instructors next to a professor. They do a lot of grading, a little bit of lecturing um, and, and help with the course. I have worked with both of these graduate students extensively. Um, I proctoring, proctoring is a more professional uh, training, also a structured project that is a semester long overseen uh, by faculty and staff at Brown. Um, so that should give you a little sense of, of how this program works. It is, again, a very flexible program that, that really can accommodate a great deal of student interest throughout the ancient Mediterranean. So now let's kick it to questions. Great. So um, starting with that first theme that Peter mentioned about uh, the different kinds of programs that are out there, and really just thinking about grad school in terms of where to apply. Um, I'm going to lump together, I think, two of the questions here just to piggyback off of um, something Laurel was just talking about. Um, so to the panelists, uh, can you talk about the the interdisciplinary nature of, I guess, all archaeology programs, but I mean, really our program, um, and maybe commenting specifically on, like, if you are a Near Eastern or someone interested in Near Eastern archaeology, how would you choose between, let's say, our program and the Egyptology and Assyriology department. Um, and because Felipe and Laurel are both cross appointed with those departments, I think I can start with them maybe. So, Laurel, do you want to pick up first? 
Yeah, sure. I would say this is one of the most common questions I get from people is which of these two programs should I apply to if I'm interested in doing both the material culture and the languages of, of the ancient Near East or Egypt? Um, and often that's a really, a really hard call. Um, I think one way to look at this is actually to, to think about what type of interdisciplinarity you are wanting. Uh, Archaeology, as you say, Dan, is inherently interdisciplinary. Um, but in addition to the material data of the place you're interested in, what else do you need to know? If, if languages are, are really central to the questions you want to ask, and if Egypt is your deepest love, then you probably belong in the Egyptology department. You can take half your classes in archaeology while doing a PhD in Egyptology, but your exams are going to focus on the language front. In archaeology, if what you are interested in is comparing Egypt to other cultures, then my gosh, you should be in the Joukowsky Institute, where your exams will require you to get a basic grounding in Greek and Roman archaeology as well. You're still going to be able to take classes in Egyptian language, but your focused training is going to be more comparative. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I agree. I think I think you should ask yourself what is what is sort of my main uh, concern and interest. I I myself combine a lot of textual and material culture, uh, and I think that if material culture is a significant part of your interest, you should be in an archaeology program because you'll be able to do much more material culture. Um, in an archaeology program than in, in straight classics. Um, so, so, so my suggestion is to think, well, what is, what is the evidence that I'm interested in? And, uh, and as I say, if it's primarily philological, you should probably be in Egyptology or in classics. If it's primarily material, the Dukowski is a great place to combine both interests. Yeah, precisely. So if, I don't think there's, you know, looking at, at classics or, or other places, there, there's not much to add to that. It is really so, yeah, if your interest is in, in the archaeology sort of in the first place, then that, that's where you go. But at the same time, the crossovers will be uh, numerous and throughout the time you spend here. And it's also for us faculty, we also uh, sit on doctoral committees in the classics or in the uh, Egyptology and Assyriology department. And so, uh, it is not that if you go to one department that you sort of isolate yourself from the other, you will definitely uh, see the others, um, at least speaking as a faculty member, but I think as, as a student, that, that is no different there. But Dan, to address kind of a side point on that front, I would say, well, how do you choose, why would you choose the Joukowsky Institute over another archaeology program outside of Brown? And there, the interdisciplinarity, I think, is also really a, a big issue. You'll see from the way we even constitute ourselves on this panel, our understanding of the archaeology of the Mediterranean is really broad. Not many places would put an archaeologist of the Sudan in, in a Mediterranean program. Um, so we're, we're not a straight classical archaeology program. We are really a Mediterranean archaeological program. And that, that breadth and that flexibility and the interest in combining theoretical and material approaches to the past, I think, is something that really stands out for the Joukowsky Institute. Yeah, that, that's a really important point. I think uh, that, that was for me one of the important points to sort of you know to come here uh, as well as a as a professor uh, rather than as a, as a grad student. But uh, I think that is what it makes it really sort of interesting. You know, working together or working with students in different parts of the Mediterranean. But I think also as uh, studying, you sort of you you are actually required through the, that exam structure, the various things you have to do that Laurel uh, talked about earlier, um, you're being asked to do um, classes and assignments that sort of really cover the, the breadth of the of the Mediterranean. And, and that's in, in fact why we all talk about Mediterranean archaeology. It is not just you know, classical archaeology. You can do uh, you know, the, the classical things and they happen. Uh, people do that, but uh, it's not just that. Just to um, sort of bridge between this and the next question, I can say from personal experience, I have Greek archaeological training, was interested in Egypt, did my study abroad in Kenya in archaeology, and ended up at the Institute in part because of that. And I'm now, you know, I TA helping to teach intro to Middle Egyptian. So you absolutely can also teach or help teach in other departments, the UTA ships. Um, and speaking of lots of different regions of the world, um, we have a couple of questions about sort of uh, 
what it's like, the importance of both studying abroad and whether to decide whether to study abroad, both either in, as an undergrad or well, how it's different to do a PhD um, elsewhere, like in Canada or Europe, um, as well as how someone should go about studying or uh, looking to study uh, in a place, archaeology in a place like South Asia that maybe is not as rep highly represented in, a, in most archaeology programs that focus on the Mediterranean. Well, I can start on the, the first issue because, I mean, this is a really interesting question, like, should I study abroad? What does that mean to study abroad? Um, Leah just mentioned that she studied abroad as an undergraduate. Um, I also studied abroad as an undergraduate. It's great if you can. It's also totally not necessary. That's a very difficult experience to have, and particularly if you are on financial aid, that's going to be more difficult to achieve. I mean, it can be helpful to expose yourself to other cultures. And I would say that's probably the chief way it helps as opposed to the specific classes that you're going to get somewhere else. But I wouldn't think that a majority of our students actually undergrad had had an abroad experience formally studying undergrad. Um, field schools or programs that, that uh, allow for excavation are more common amongst our students. It's kind of great if you can, and you shouldn't think of it as a, a make or break. When you're a graduate student, studying abroad is kind of a different issue. So your three years of coursework have to be at Brown. Um, you can get a fellowship to do study that is not coursework in your subsequent years sometimes. Um, so we have had students go to Rome for a year or to Athens for a year um, on a research fellowship, for instance. Yeah, I, I think that's an important point there. Uh, Laurel is sort of, um, the sort of the term time here, uh, semester time, tends to be pretty intensive, and that's when everybody, uh, well, normally speaking, uh, not so much under COVID, but when everybody is around. And but at the same time, in the time in between, uh, and not just in the summer, but also in the winter, that's when fieldwork happens, and that's when uh, most faculty and students are abroad in either of the periods. And I say winter because particularly. Uh, Laurel and her uh, team fieldwork in the Sudan takes place uh, sort of over in sort of December, January uh, period. And so, yes, studying uh, abroad, um, either as an undergraduate before or during the grad program happens, but it's not, it's more likely that people will go abroad for shorter experiences and, or exchanges and, and that sort of thing. I can, I can take the, the second part of the question. I, I, I think it's a relevant question. If you're interested in parts of the world that are other than the Mediterranean, the Tchaikovsky Institute is not probably for you for grad school uh, because we are so heavily centered on the Mediterranean. What you would like to do is to find institutions where there are people who are experts in that region and who work in that region and 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 and, and try to go there uh, to work with specialists. All of the faculty at the Dukowski, even though we have different interests, are focused in the Mediterranean. So. Just to chime in there um, from my own personal experience, because I came to the Dukowski as a Mediterranean archeologist, that's what my background was in. And I uh, find myself writing a dissertation on Peru and um, on Jordan, uh, you know, things happen in the course of graduate work that are a little based on serendipity and, and your interest evolving. Um, but at least in the Tchaikovsky, I mean, those interests are, are often very much supported. And so, um, especially if you're interested in thematic questions, um, you can do a lot of kind of Mediterranean plus sort of things. And the Mediterranean itself is a very kind of um, uh, permeable concept that can extend far beyond just, you know, the geographic bounds of it. Um, but as Felipe said, I think definitely if, if you're interested in a place like um, South Asia or you know anywhere else really, like it, it would be useful to find those specialists and find what universities there are out um, that have the resources for that. Um, but can let's I, transition. Uh, yeah. Dan, can I perhaps uh, pick up on that? Because that's as uh, well, perhaps yeah. also sort of going, connecting back a little to sort of earlier, because as you mentioned Peru, uh, I think it's also important to mention that there is uh, th there are, you know, the Tchaikovsky Institute, we're not the only group of archaeologists uh, on the Brown campus here. Uh, there's also a group uh, of uh, archaeologists as part of the anthropology department, um, fac both faculty and graduate students. And uh, those 
students. You, so you can also uh, work towards a PhD uh, while doing archaeology, but not working towards the PhD in archaeology, but one that is in anthropology, part of the anthropology department. And that is uh, research also focused on the on the new world uh, from uh, North America uh, down to well, down to Peru, uh, basically basically down to South America. And again, we're not very far apart on uh, campus work closely together. I'm personally also co-appointed as a faculty member in the anthropology department. Uh, well, and as Dan just uh, told everyone, and he demonstrates the sort of the combination uh, of those uh, parts that happens as well. And just as Leah has been uh, working as a teaching assistant in, works as a teaching assistant in, in the Egyptology department, Dan has worked in the anthropology department on a course, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I um, I TA'd for a GIS class, and so there's a lot of methodological overlaps, and regional overlaps. Um, but let's actually on the topic, let's shift to how to prepare for grad school, um, and maybe we can be a little bit more uh, rapid fire with these because a lot of the questions actually were, were relating more to these issues. Um, so regarding coursework, we have a question about, um, you know, if if you're someone who's interested in the Near East, but in your undergraduate um, career you didn't have the opportunity to take many classes on that subject, um, is that something that would be a problem or would that be something that you would flag in their application as, as perhaps missing? Uh, maybe Felipe, do you wanna pick that up? Um, it's an interesting question. I think, that, I think that as long as you can demonstrate both focused interest in archeology span and, and, and and sort of some awareness that you know what archaeology is about, uh, perhaps sort of not extensive experience in this or that area will not, I think, be be counted against you. Um, you're all young, probably, and 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 there's a lot to to learn. And so, as long as again, as, as long as you can demonstrate sort of sort of some awareness of what archaeology is, and 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 sort of earnest interest in, 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 in this or that aspect of archaeology, I think regional sort of uh, shortcomings or whatever you want to call them are not, are not going to be counted against you. And maybe my colleagues have different ideas about them. No, I totally agree with that, Philippe. And I, I think it's, uh, that's something also, so particularly perhaps if there are uh, people watching this from, from Europe who would be used to sort of much shorter and focused PhD programs, uh, that's the advantage of the six year PhD programs and taking courses where you actually have the opportunity to, to adjust or to uh, add to your, your preparation. And I think for us, when we read these applications, it's we're well aware that um, there's only so many places in the country where, you know, the courses in uh, Near Eastern uh, archaeology are, are being taught. So it, it, you know, it would limit the number of applicants very much if we would really strictly in, insist on that sort of thing. And so, yeah. I would say as advice for applying, if that is the case for you, think about how you can demonstrate to us that your interest is real and is deep without having the coursework. How can you show us that this isn't just, I saw something on the History Channel and it looked cool, but rather um, I'm committed to and know, uh, know what I'm getting into for a PhD program. What experiences did you seek outside of the classroom since the classroom couldn't give you what you wanted on that. So you do have to tell us why we should believe in your interest if you couldn't take the classes, but we are totally happy to be convinced. Great. Um, okay, moving on to another sort of requirement that, or non-requirement, but um, issue that comes up in applications um, is languages. Um, and we have uh, questions on both sides of the coin. And I think, uh, Felipe, I might direct this to you first off as the person in charge of languages uh, at first. So the first one side of the coin is um, not being fluent in, converse, in like conversational English um, and how that affects the chances uh, and what the TOEFL scores that you guys look for are and how exactly you assess and what level of English proficiency you require or look for. And the flip side of that being how important is work in non-English languages, so in ancient and modern, that will you'll need the program ahead of application. All right, let, let me start with the, with the first question about uh, uh, fluency in English. It is really important that you be fluent in English because all of the coursework will happen in English and it would be one would be at a disadvantage and 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 it's not something that I think uh, 
we or you would like to to have happen. And so it is important to be fluent. It doesn't have to be sort of sort of the most perfect English, but but um, and and as as you can see in in this uh, webinar, two of the faculty members are not native English speakers. I mean, we 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 learned English as as young people, um, and so. So the short answer is yes, it's important to know English quite well. Um, we don't often look at the TOEFL score. I mean, there's some minimum from the grad school and I don't know what the minimum is, but, it, but your letter and your um, sample, writing sample and your, your interview, if we get to that point, will tell us basically what your level is. As for the other question, which is uh, competence in other languages, both ancient and modern, we're pretty flexible with, uh, with uh, language learning. We are all convinced that it's important that you know the language of the place where you, most, where you do most of your work, whether it's in Spain or Greece or Jordan, that you have some cap capacity to communicate with people on the ground. And so we, we encourage you to learn those languages. The Mediterranean is a very polyglot environment. So knowing a few languages is, is gonna get you places both practically and also academically. Uh, and for the ancient languages, uh, many students uh, like Leah and Dan have interest in languages and, and, and work a little bit with languages. Dan, who works on agricultural areas, has had quite a lot of success looking at papyri that mention agricultural infrastructure. And Leah is interested in medical stuff, so much more philological. But I think we encourage those um, incursions into languages. And so you don't need to be sort of a, a, a Greek philologist to come here, but, but if you're interested in that, we'll certainly encourage your, your learning languages. I, I would say this question often comes up as with the question about Near Eastern background. Um, you know, if you're at a university or a college that doesn't teach Greek and Latin, and you're applying with interest in the classical world and you don't have any Greek or Latin, are you at a huge disadvantage? Um, because we do have a, a fairly high language requirement for the PhD, having some language background helps not so much as a, a litmus test, but really as a, as a sort of, well, you have less to do once you get here. And so your chances of success are higher if you have some language learning before you come in. Um, Again, I would say if you have not had access to what you wanted to do, say so. Talk about what you have been able to do. Uh, if you've taken a modern language and instead, that will really help. You know, if, if your French is out of the way, then you have more time to learn Latin. Yeah. Great. Um, so let's shift to field work, which is the other big kind of uh, application issue. Um, so I'll try to bundle these together a little bit as well. Um, we have a question that asks about, you know, the difference between, let's say, field work and lab-based research experience, um, whether we give any kind of um, greater privilege to one or the other, um, whether people who have no field work at all are going to be um, perhaps kind of penalized in the application process. Um, and there's a question as well about not being able to excavate due to the pandemic, which I think I can answer and just say, we all understand it. And I don't think any of us have been doing any field work for the past uh, two years. Um, so I'll, I'll take care of that one. But as for the broader question about, yeah, um, how much field work do you need field work? Um, does lab work count as well? Um, what are the kinds of things that you look for in applications? So let's start with Peter. Yeah, well, field work is, well, I guess, it, you know, well, yeah, you presented it as a sort of yours comparable to language. And I think in that sense, it's sort of, it very much is. It's like the languages, it's not a formal requirement uh, for admission. So uh, that's not the case. But as Laura was explaining for the languages, it is pretty important. Field work uh, is an, you know, inherent, important element of the whole uh, doctoral program. Uh, everybody's uh, doing field work in one place or another, as well as lab work, you know, to different degrees, depends on the research interests. Um, and once sort of in the program that we don't much uh, distinguish between that. But um, I think having some field experience, we really sort of consider as a, a really important uh, thing. So we have had, I think, sort of people who 
had had little field work, but who could demonstrate that they were in the summer before starting the first year were uh, doing weeks or months, uh, I think in one case I remember, of field work. And yeah, that, that's, that's something that can go a long way in, in explaining these things. But again, I think there is, again, what, what we've been saying, what Laurel just said, if for whatever reason there's a real, you know, there are con circumstances that really uh, don't allow you to do field work, apart from the pandemic, which has affected everybody, get in touch and be upfront about it. And, and then we can see uh, how to handle that. It's super impressive to me when an applicant says, I couldn't go in the field because I had work study requirements and, and, and I had family obligations and I couldn't do it. But this is how I established a way of having experiences hands on with artifacts anyway. And here's the local historical society where I volunteered for 10 hours a week since, since my sophomore year. So it's not, it's not entirely the experience itself. It's the, the mindful and dedicated approach to getting experiences that are relevant to training you and, and to you yourself knowing that this is what you want to do. Tell us these things. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a really sort of important thing, uh, Laurel, because I think I we could just say sort of, you know, if you are in those circumstances and we really know how expensive uh, field schools uh, mm -hmm. can be. And so don't go into that <laughs> before those things just for, for these admission purposes. Uh, be open about it talk to us and you know that that is the sort of the the, the way to to go about it that doesn't you know take away that field work is important as i was saying but th oh, there yeah. are ways to deal with that and to, to to go about that great um and i will say too i think this um ties into a piece of advice that i was given repeatedly and i think is really valuable which is if you're looking to apply to a place and there's a professor there who lines with your interests, email them before your application, email them well in advance to say, introduce yourself, um, let them know who you are and why you're interested in their work and their program. And that they'll, in my experience, all give you very good guidance. I had people tell me, I don't think you'd be a good fit. And I had other people say, I think it'd be great. We look forward to seeing your application, right? Um, so it's a really good idea to be in touch with exactly who you decide to apply to work with, or not specifically to work with, but people in the programs you decide to apply to in advance. To Although we, I want to jump in there and say yeah. that's also not a requirement. No, like, no, no. Zero. And, and in fact, you should not feel obligated to get in touch if you don't have a real question. Yes, there is that. That doesn't help your application at all. If you have, if you have a real question about my research and you say, "Wow, Professor Bestock, I think I want to work with you." would you need this, et cetera? Can you tell me this in the field? Then that's a real question. And then that does give me an, an opportunity to answer you as a real person. If you just say, I think Egypt is neat. Can I be on your radar? Just submit your application. I'll see your application. And that specifically applies also to what we were just talking about field work. If for whatever circumstances you have not been able to do that, I think that that is precisely one of those serious issues that it's worth uh, contacting anybody about that could be a faculty member you're interested in if you're not sort of sure about that then uh either uh, laurel is the director of graduate studies or myself as the overall director that that would be sort of appropriate but really anybody here um, would be good but but also just don't feel obligated to be in touch i want to stress that again and again and i partly want to draw on my own experience i clearly got into graduate school i was super shy i was super scared about these big important professors i was applying to and there was no way and this was like email was a different beast back when i was applying to to graduate school there was just no way i was going to get in touch with professors in advance even the ones i really wanted to work with and um that did not stop me from getting into graduate school you shouldn't feel obligated to be in touch. Yes, that is a good point. And you don't have to be. And if you do, make sure you proofread those emails a few times over <laughs> would be my other suggestion. Um, I spent a few days on most of my emails that I sent to professors and I sent them to schools where I wasn't sure if my interests aligned, but I thought that the aims of the program did um, really well. So that can be another reason too. Um, Moving on to sort of another, I guess, quick fire question would be about um, master's degrees and whether they're worth doing, whether we should do them in, whether they need to be in archaeology or they can be in related fields and sort of 
um, how does a master's degree both, I think, affect your application? And also, I think it's important to note that we don't uh, excuse coursework for master's degrees like some um, programs do that you'll look into. Sorry, maybe Peter, you could take yeah, that. Yeah, I'll, uh, um, I, I think, well, Leah, your, your final point there sort of uh, sets the stage really for that since we don't make a distinction between whether you've done the master's or not. So in that sense, no, it's not a requirement. And it, it's definitely not a requirement. It's also not the sort of that we divide the, the pile of applications into two sort of, you know, the ones with and the ones without uh, masters. That's absolutely uh, not the case, I think. You know, and there's the, it is not just sort of whether a master's is useful, um, because apart from the fact that it sort of takes time, masters tend to cost a lot of money. Uh, since there's, there are very few funded master's uh, degrees around. And so it depends on your undergraduate degree, depends on your personal situation. Uh, whether you can, if you can get funding, there are funded masters around, uh, or if you can say secure funding from perhaps from the region where you live, that, that, you know, some of those regions have funding to go and do a master uh, elsewhere. Yeah, it can be a great experience doing um, and uh, doing a master because it sort of gives you an additional specialization. If you feel that your undergraduate degree was sort of particularly, you know, didn't give you the opportunity to develop one element of something that you're really interested in, then you could go and do that. But um, it's not uh, an obligation. So if I think, well, I'll uh, first want to see Felipe or Laurel, do you want to uh, add something to that? Uh, Laurel? Well, sure, I can say, and again, thinking, okay, I'm giving advice to people who are going to be applying to graduate school. Why not apply for both master's and PhD programs? You know, we have certainly admitted multiple students in recent years who have applied repeatedly to Brown. And the first time they applied, they didn't have the background to succeed and we didn't admit them. That's not a judgment of them, <coughs> a judgment of their, their readiness for the program. They went and did a master's somewhere else and, and then applied to Brown and got in. They, you don't hurt your chances of getting into Brown later by applying now. Um, and you certainly give yourself a, a range of options if, if you are also applying to master's programs, um, if you yourself are not quite sure if you need that would be my advice. Yeah, you know, I think it has it, happened that it has happened, it, it can happen that you know, you're very well aware of what you're doing. And it, I, I've, I've known people that in their undergrad become quite concentrated and focused in archaeology and, and, and know the field. Uh, and I think, I, I think a master's can help you if you're not sure what you're doing. I think a master's is probably a one way to 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 figure it out um but then as i say there there are people who don't need to figure it out who who just very early on understand what they're interested in and the big questions they want to tackle and and so both both types of people exist and and i think that makes a huge difference and both types of people get into the Joukowsky institute so we have taken students right. who've gone and done a master's degree we've also taken students straight out of the bachelor's degree Precisely. And it's actually sort of what Philippe emphasizes there is that it's not so much the, the courses that you take uh, during the master's degrees, it's just, it's just the sort of the more general additional experience, academic experience, but also life experience that you uh, acquire during that. So, and an alternative way, what we've seen several uh, people who we've admitted in the past uh, who've done that just went and worked for, for two year, two, one or two years or three years in uh, in relevant uh, activities, commercial archaeology, CRM uh, is one, you know, and that, for instance, would give you the great advantage of having a ton of fieldwork experience um, that obviously uh, will stand you in good stead uh, later on and has the advantage of uh, actually paying you and uh, work if you could work in a museum, if that would be relevant. So, you know, that, that sort of experience that, yeah, that, that could all uh, help you. And, and I think it's more that sort of way, but as Felipe said, if you're not sure whether you want to sort of launch right into uh, a graduate program to a PhD program, doing something else, which could be a master's or there are other, those specialized uh, language baccalaureate programs and those sort of things that might be options, but other relevant work or internship experience could be just as good.
And I'll just add briefly that when I applied out of undergrad, I did, as Laurel said, I applied to master's and PhD programs, um, including Brown. And my top choice PhD program, I didn't get into. And so I did a master's, which was great, um, a little expensive. And um, when I applied for PhD the, the second time, my top choice PhD program was no longer even on my list um, because my, my interests had sort of evolved enough, um, which isn't to say that I wouldn't have been happy there, but you know, like Felipe said, like, you know, we're constantly learning new things and, and changing um, our interests. And so, can I just jump in? Yeah, actually, yeah, why don't you that that? I actually took two years between um, applying out of undergrad because I really couldn't decide whether I wanted to be doing Greek archaeology or Egyptian and what I exactly, or if I, or if I really was ready for a PhD. And so I, I took a year, I got a scholarship to do a master's, and then I worked for a year in archaeological engagement. And it was really helpful, both in taking the time to really consider if, uh, what it meant to give six years of your life to a PhD and if I wanted to do it and clarify my interest and connection to archaeology, but also picking a program is a big choice. And I think that um, sometimes, like Dan said, the extra clarity of what you're interested in, what grad school feels like as in a master's can help you know where you're going to be the happiest for the long haul when you pick a pick a PhD. So it's Certainly don't need it. Mine, my master's is not in archaeology; it's in museum studies. But um, I think it can also help if you apply to both um, to give you some clarity before picking a PhD. Sorry, Dan. Yeah, precisely. And, and Leah, what you say there, so that clarity is also and having the time. So you know, senior year is when you're writing a thesis and so on can be sort of a pretty, or can be, should be, will be a pretty busy hectic year and then sort of clearing your mind and writing uh, a good application that's which i guess will be the next point we'll talk about but you know being able to do that 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 as philippe said some people just do that but it can be a tall order and so having the time to do that properly might actually uh, help you a lot um Leah, do you want to ask about yeah. uh, the most recent question yeah, sure. I'm going to make it visible to everyone. Hit answer live. So we have a question um, in the chat, in the Q&A um, that says, in case someone manages to find new data and perspectives on the topic they'd like to focus on, is it possible to make small turns on the topic during your postgraduate course, for example, in the second year? Or is it necessary for the subject matter to remain constant? And I think we can tie that in as we transition to the process of applying of what is a statement of intent on your research? And how much of an effect does that have on what you actually have to research once you're in grad school? And Laurel, I'm gonna go to you first because I know oh, you have <laughs> because I'm laughing and you know I have opinions on on this front. Um, of course, your your topic is gonna change as you find new things. If it doesn't, I mean, then that's not scholarship any longer. So, um, no, we encourage that. But in fact, the timing asked in that question is really interesting for the Dukowski Institute too because you don't have a research project yet in your second year. You are not working on your dissertation yet in your second year. You are still in courses and still taking exams. You might have an idea uh, and you might be doing field work that's relevant to it, but you don't have a formal approved project yet. And as, as Leah said, that actually ties in really well with the application question because don't apply to us by giving us a proposal for what you want to do for your dissertation. You're not there yet. We want to see that you have defined interests. It is good to tell us what kind of stuff you want to work on. But you won't be happy at Brown if you're just spending three years of coursework twiddling your thumbs waiting until you get to the dissertation. You should be learning and growing as a scholar during that, that time. And then when you're dissertating, heck yes, you should change your topic while you're, I mean, not, not a sea change, but your topic will change and grow as you, as you learn things, as you find things. Yeah, precisely. And that works actually sort of in, in two ways or in, in double ways almost, because on the one hand, you know, you need to have your interests, but then in the beginning of this, this webinar, we were talking about the interdisciplinarity and the breadth of the program that we want sort of people to work, you know, or, or be cognizant of sort of whatever goes on throughout the, the entire Mediterranean. And so if you come in, I really want to do stuff on Egypt, then you have to take exams on, on Roman and Italy and Spanish stuff will come around. And we would encourage you to go and do field work on the other side of the Mediterranean. And all those experiences might change your minds and you might up, 
after those three years do a topic on something very different if that happens that's great because you know you found something so not unlike sort of uh, dan was saying sort of in another way uh, just now but on the other hand if after those three years you think no i'm still going to do my egyptian topic that i was in or you know something egyptian as you want to so much the better because it's it just shows uh that it's then a really sort of you know much more considered uh choice and that you know what it is and why you're, you're interested in that so yeah speaking as a second year i came in like i know what i'm doing sure i'll change my topic and i can tell you that by now i'm already like oh there's no possible way to answer the question i had right and i had a whole idea of how i was going to do it it so you're going to change it like and by your second year even though i don't know exactly what it's going to be i know it will not be what i proposed coming in okay so let's move um oh, there's so many questions coming in apologies if we are not able to get to all of them i'm trying to bundle them all together in ways that are still cohesive um let's talk about just basically like the relative importance of gpa letters of recommendation um the writing sample like what are you looking for in a writing sample um i guess yeah just how do you how do you weigh different things in the application and the materials that um, people submit so um Felipe. sure um i think i think for the letter of application i recommend being very concrete and specific and try to be clear or as clear as possible um I, I will say something, and if my colleagues disagree, maybe they can they can chip in. But there there is a certain tendency in 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 some uh, letters of application to be anecdotal about the moment you fell with our fell in love with archaeology and stuff like that. And and while that is important personally, it's less I think valuable in a in a letter. It's more it's it's I think it's more important to know what you've accomplished already where you want to go what you've done in the classroom what you've done in the lab or what you've done in the field what languages you know what languages you want to know um whether you are sort of fascinated with survey or with archaeobotanical data or with lagoons or with as leah is with birthing stools and and gynecological instruments um I think that level of specificity is good to say, well, I'm really fascinated by 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 health and by the study of health in antiquity. And I've read a bunch of this stuff and I'm interested in, in whatever medical tools. I think I think specificity, concreteness, clarity is good both about what you've done and about what you want to do. And so I, I, I recommend that for the letter of application. But maybe uh, Laurel, you can add something. Yeah, no, I agree. But I also think that the, the package is a total package. So it's that that kind of clarity and excitement and and drive is going to come through in all of the elements of this. And, and that's what we're really looking for. So pick letter writers who know you well and can speak again with specificity and clarity about uh, what you have done and why they have confidence that what you will do going forward is, is scholarship, not just being a good student. Um, and likewise, your GPA, I, does it have to be a 4.0? Of course, it doesn't have to be a 4.0. Do you need to have taken a range of classes with, with good enough grades that show us that you uh, have a sustained interest and real ability in this and that that is reflected in your coursework? Yes, that does need to be the case. Um, and a, you know, a, a single C in your freshman year is something you can get over much better than than four Bs in your senior year in archaeology classes. We're also looking for your arc as a person um, as, as you come closer to, to doing this. So it's really a whole package. And, and again, that clarity and coherence and, and that we believe you when you say you are interested because you are specific and clear is what you're trying to show us. Yeah, I think it's the sort of emphasis, you know, the, the word that we like to use in this is sort of holistic that we, for two reasons, for on the one hand, uh, we really look at the application as a whole, there is no sort of hidden agenda somewhere in which we give points, so many points for each sort of for this question and more question, more points or that for the other, which is then totted up and divided and that doesn't work like that. It's sort of, we read these things and try to sort of get a, a an overall holistic idea and also holistic in the sense that 
uh, it is uh, five at the moment faculty members who, well, no, there's more who initially read as well, but eventually it's the five core faculty members who, who read and who, who take these decisions in a discussion uh, about the um, applicants once you know the, the list gets uh, whittled down a little bit and and that doesn't sort of work on the basis of you know a, more points for this more points for that person it is really trying to understand the applicants as a person really um, rather than just a, a piece of paper with headings on it on to another question on a different topic um we have a lot of people in the chat and who've asked questions that um uh are international or from outside the us which is really great to see and so bundling a couple more questions together can you talk a little bit about what it's like to apply as an international student um how that might work with visas not necessarily getting into all the like details of that process but um the support for visas the support for international students um and uh potential you know scholarship sources things like that um so i guess let's start from the left again from felipe <laughs> Yeah, so I'm myself I'm not American and I applied several times to grad school uh, during my career and it worked the same in all the programs that I've been a part of and it works the same here. We, we, we select the candidates basically without thinking about where they're from, at least not, not in terms of sort of the diplomacy involved in, 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 in that issue. Once you've been selected, uh, the university works with you to facilitate the acquisition of a visa and also sorting out uh, sort of the, the details with the government. And, and there are a series of scholarly and student visas that you can, that you can obtain for the duration of your stay and one year uh, past your schooling. So whether it's two years or six years or however long it takes you to complete a PhD, one year after that, you can stay. Um, so I wouldn't be sort of overly concerned at this moment with uh, the bureaucracy involved in the visa process. And as I say, both in this program and, any, and actually in every program that I've been a part of, the selection is, is not sort of contingent on your being from one place or another. And I would say on the funding front, it's also immaterial, whether you're a foreigner or an American, we give the same stipend and it is a sufficient living wage to foreign students and um, American students. Yeah, and that is something particularly for uh, people applying from abroad who might not be used uh, to that. It's worth emphasizing uh, again that we only uh, we fully fund everybody we admit. That's the sort of the, the approach to it, and that has the flip side of it that we do not admit uh, people who would come with their own funding. You know, whether it's personal funding or um, a grant given by your hometown or home country or so. Sort of, we it's as Philippe just emphasized. It is the admission process that we're now talking about that comes first and foremost, and then once admitted, um, we'll take care of, um, well, we, the university takes care of funding and, and visas. And I probably we need to add, to add in as much as possible because uh, the way the world is that there are um, difficult situations, but uh, that, that's not what we, you know, that should not be our starting point. Great, um, I think now with five minutes left, um, we're gonna round it out back with a sort of more general question looking towards applying for grad school, which is, um, but what exactly the expectations and workload requirements are, um, you know, how I, I personally think about this as my full time job and I try to um, remember that it is my job and not my identity, which I think is important, but um, that also comes with sort of a question we had about how part time work fits in with it, um, as well as um, Laurel, I know that as our DGS and the person who sends the welcome document to the first years, you might have some opinions to jump in. This is a full-time job. This is a full-time job. You need to do this full-time or you will not succeed. That's why we pay you is so that you can do it full-time. You not only, uh, you, you really should not work outside of this uh, for, for money or really on any other thing that isn't directly related. Um, yeah, and if you're, if you're not American, you are not allowed to work. Correct. So. Yeah, precisely. And that, that's the really point, you know, that's where this question is really good after the funding question that we got before. The whole reason, the big reason why you are fully funded and, you know, seriously funded, funded is uh, 
that you won't have the time uh, to work to work your way through the program. So you don't have to do that. Generally speaking, graduate students find it more than a full time job to be graduate students. It's the work expectations for the program are really are really high. Um, and that's, you know, the coursework and the exams and whatnot. The proctorships and TA ships that you do are actually defined. Our graduate students are unionized and that is a work requirement of 15 to 18 hours per week um, during the semesters when you hold TA ships or proctorships. But otherwise, your job is to take classes and write exams and learn. Great. Well, we have about three minutes left. Um, we can do one. I think we're basically getting through them all, except for some specific ones, which we'll we'll answer on the side. But I guess just to wrap it up, Leah, unless you have anything else, um, I was going to ask just what is the most common mistake that you see when you get applications? Like, if you could give one piece of advice to someone applying to the Joukowsky, what would it be? Well, something that's important for us here is that, as I just said, in how we consider the applications, how we look at them, and that we decide, you know, take our decisions collectively in a discussion. So writing, you know, and I'm talking specifically about the program, about our program here, but writing an application that's totally and exclusively uh, targeting just <laughs> one person, sort of, you know, it's not you want to come and study at the Jarkovsky Institute, but I want to come and study with Professor X, that I think would not help you. It wouldn't necessarily sync it, the application right away, but it wouldn't help. All agreed. Yeah, no, definitely. You're applying to a specific program and showing your awareness of what that program is like and why it's a good fit for you <laughs> uh, is, is a wise thing to do. And if we are in close to wrapping up, I just want to draw everybody's attention to a message just uh, gone into the chat uh, about our website with the, the URL and um, where you can find you know, much more uh, information, a, a new series of uh, frequently asked questions and so on. Um, if I could also add that if you want to reach out to a graduate student to ask about what grad school is like, I highly recommend it. Um, you can find all of our bios, what we're interested in, what we work on, and our emails under the people tab on that too. So when you're filling out grad schools, it's a good idea not just to talk to faculty, but if you're thinking seriously about a program, talk to the grad students there too. We don't fight yeah, it. Precisely, if you're really looking for an inside view, uh, you should ask the students, not the professors. The, here we've been talking about the admissions program in which we obviously uh, you know, have a large say. But uh, if you want to see how it is and how it's sort of really what a grad school is for you, then Leah and colleagues are the ones to talk to. Great. Well, um, I guess let's thank our three panelists. And uh, thank you. I mean, there's no applause, but thank you. And <laughs> um, you guys. And we really want to thank you too as well for uh, you know helping getting us through all these questions and we really hope and so thank everybody uh, who has been who's been logged on and who's been following us uh, i hope this has been helpful and uh, if you uh, are interested um, you can as we said more information on our website uh, and otherwise we look forward to see your application thank you very much